All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to David from Folk Revival. Thanks for joining. This might be an investor-type conversation, so I think the listeners are in for a treat. For people who don't know, what is Folk Revival? Folk Revival right here is a high-protein, low-carb, hot cereal made with acorns. Bomb drop, right? Acorn. So people, for people listening, so I grew up in New England. New England's full of acorns. Never in my wildest dreams, and probably for Nick here either, would we ever think about consuming them. And so at the same time as, let's say, a potential investor, I think that's an exciting, there's something exciting about that. There's an interesting marketing opportunity. Squirrels come to mind. It's a clear brand. Like you can sort of see it in your head immediately. How did you get even into the world of knowing acorns are nutritious? Maybe you're a squirrel fan. If squirrels eat them, they must be somewhat nutritious. What did you see? So I first encountered acorns as food many, many years ago, like six, seven years ago. I read an article in a you know, in the Atlantic or in the New Yorker or something. And it was like a little introduction to acorns. I, at the time, did not know that acorns were edible also. But I've since learned that they're consumed all over the world. Was it high end? Was it like like fine dining? Because sometimes the innovation comes from the chefs on the fine dining side or the other side? No, it, it's always been like just a traditional food. So it's been, it, they've been consumed by people all over the world. Oak trees grow across the world. They're still consumed in pockets here and there around the world today. And... In the U.S., in North America, they're consumed by Native Americans. They've been consumed by indigenous people in North America since, you know, pre-Columbian times. And they're still sort of like a prized heritage food amongst, you know, different tribes, different groups. And it always intrigued me. So that was the origin. But also, I've been in the food industry for a really long time. So, and I've been running innovation teams and always sort of keeping my finger on the pulse of interesting quirky foods out there. And I, the more I learned, the more I realized, wow, this is like a huge untapped sort of natural resource literally right underneath our feet. Yeah. We use wild harvested upcycled acorns and we're putting them to good use. So what do you do with them? So I'm sure everyone's going nuts. They're like, all right, so what do you do with an acorn? I grew up with them. How do you clean them? What's the process for getting them to the point of digestion. Yeah, so the, you can't really pick an acorn off of the ground or off of a tree and eat it. Good to know, I won't um, do that. Right, okay. <laughs> so if you were to do that, if you were to try that, you'd probably spit it out, it'd be really bitter. It's sort of like an olive. You can't really pick an olive off of a tree and that's eat right. it either. That's there's right, there's a, that's a good example. There's a big process, yeah. Right, so you have to, you have to wash the bitter flavors out of them. Okay. And when you do that, you're left essentially with like a tree nut. It's, it's literally a tree nut. So it's, you know, it has the nutritional profile similar to other tree nuts we're familiar with, walnuts and almonds, etc. How do you wash them? Is it like boiling them or is it like a, what's involved in that? So you have to crack open the shell. So the acorn that we're all familiar with, it's like, it looks like a little nut, has a little cap on it. You have to actually take the cap off. You have to crack that open. Then inside is actually the nut. So inside there's like the meat of the acorn. You take that, you, there's different ways of doing it. And actually if you were to go online, there's tons of examples. It's done, you know, today you can find YouTube examples of people making acorn flour at home and washing their own acorns and washing out the, those bitter flavors. Yeah. Um, the way we do it is we essentially um, grind it down into sort of like a flour and then we soak it. We use cold water rather than hot water that preserves the vitamins and minerals. And we do that repeatedly of like soaking and uh, rinsing until essentially the water runs clear. And then, like I said, you're left with like this very mild sort of nutty, delicious little tree nut then they're uh, they're dried and packaged and it's it's pretty time consuming and arduous to do if you're if you have an oak tree in your backyard it's it's a fun exercise i recommend people do it but it's a lot of work t for you know a pound of flour this is interesting so when as you're saying this i'm just thinking out loud i'm thinking like about quinoa so from peru so quinoa uh, which has sort of made an emergence in the food world uh -huh. as like an ancient grain and now it's sort of uh, considered like a superfood and you can find it at a lot of restaurants here in Los Angeles or, or just in general to the point where other countries are now making it. And so it's almost like it gave exposure to this market. So I can, I get it. Okay. So now you, you, you got that side of the story. What did you see in the product space? So what did you see as an opportunity for, I want to make a product. What's the product? Where do I see a hole, a gap in the market? What was it like to discuss, like to get to where you have, what you have in front of us? Great question. So I started with the product like with the with the brand idea first which is a which is a little unusual in the food industry most food brands we know and love start with someone's recipe or their or their grandmother's recipe right and they decide they're going a lot, to, lot, yeah that's true 
So it's it's pretty unusual. So I actually started with sort of the the idea, the brand idea. I really wanted to launch a brand that was focused on heirloom and heritage foods. It's something I know and care quite a bit about. I've worked in this natural food industry for 20 years, but before that, I ran my own organic farm and studied agriculture policy and always, even though I was doing for 20 years, I've been doing sort of corporate natural organic food marketing. I always kept my finger on the pulse of what was happening at the cutting edge. Always, you know, I still have friends who are organic farmers and always sort of kept one toe in that water. And I saw that I saw that there was a white space there. There really weren't, you know, any brands that had really planted their flag and said, you know what, we're going to be an heirloom food company. Okay. okay. We're all sort of familiar with heirlooms. We're all sort of maybe even familiar with heritage foods, things like acorns. Quinoa is a great example, yeah, right? Right. Okay. Um, but there wasn't a brand that was really sort of planting the flag there. So I saw a little bit of white space. That started to emerge very early on as I left my corporate job for for this endeavor. Congratulations. And the world you. thanks you for doing that. And as that brand sort of architecture was taking shape, I started going through a, you know, a typical innovation brainstorm and screener, sort of throwing a hundred ideas against the wall and looking at size of prize and ease of execution and profitability and all, you know, consumer appeal, all the sort of different screener questions one would ask. This is what food companies do. This is how they launch new products and decide. So I was using the same sort of model. And one of the ideas that was rising to the top was oatmeal. We were literally throwing 100 ideas against the wall. But oatmeal was one of the the top ideas. And I was already eating this sort of funky, high protein, delicious oatmeal alternative that was primarily nuts and seeds. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that, you know what, I could add acorns into this. I had dabbled with making acorn and acorn flour a few years ago. And I started investigating the supply chain. Where can I buy this? And is it sustainable? And decided to incorporate it. Incorporated it. It tasted really good. And started investigating that competitive landscape. This isn't a category I had previously, you know, managed. And I looked and I saw that it's actually sort of a boring category. Oatmeal, it's a big category, but it's big and flat and mature and there's not that much innovation. Hasn't been disrupted in any meaningful way. Not really. And then when it comes to just, again, thinking out loud, when it comes to, I think about quinoa versus like another grain, right? It's got so many more, so much more protein or nutrients. And so is it the same with the acorns where it's just like, it's a better for you version of the oatmeal? So there's a bunch of nuts and seeds and hemp and other ingredients inside folk revival. So acorn is sort of the hero ingredient that we tout, but it's not the first ingredient. Yeah. But it's low carb. I see here you got two grams of net carbs on. Very low carb, very high protein. Your typical oatmeal might have in a serving this size might have six or seven grams of protein. There are some other competitors that are sprinkling in some other protein, maybe bumping it up to 10 grams. This has 20 grams of protein because those are all oat based. They're oatmeal based. Oats a grain. It has, you know, roughly 30 grams of carbs per serving. This, as you said, has, you know, less than five, depending on the skew. So this is for the new consumer, basically. The new consumer today is more interested in this type of thing. Yeah. So I realized that you have to, like, when you're launching something into grocery, you have to you have to offer the retailers something that makes it hard for them to say no to. Yeah. What was that like? Well, the last thing they need is, like, another, you know apple cinnamon oatmeal cup they already have five on their shelf and they're charged and they're you know their mandate is to grow their categories so if you can offer them something new and differentiated although not too differentiated because then it's you know the the market's not ready for it it will bring new consumers into the category and when i sort of surveyed the competitive landscape and i saw that there really weren't any brands that were doing like high protein low carb oatmeal i was already eating one at home yeah um for quite a while so it seemed like there was a little white space there. And it was sort of, you know, at the end of that innovation exercise and a little bit of surveying, I realized, I think we have our first product to launch with. I mean, there's so many questions I can get into, but from that perspective, so when it comes to just sourcing, is it difficult? Is it easy? Are you the only player in town? Are you the largest now acorn buyer in America? What does this I look like? probably am. Okay. I probably am. So okay. there aren't many places that are processing acorns on, you know, an industrial or even like a semi-industrial scale, which you need. If you're, if you, you know, you need a dependable supply chain that's not going to be disrupted by, you know, like a weather event in one area and that type of thing. So I've lived through that in my career. So we found a supplier, we got to know each other. They're very 
cooperative and collaborative and actually became a very early investor in the brand. They re as we got to know each other and they got more familiar with what we were trying to do here in the U.S., they offered to invest and get in on it. And it's become a wonderful partnership. Okay. And then establishing your price point. What does it cost you to make one of these guys? What do you what do you sell them for? So we so we sell it on folkrevival.com for three ninety nine a cup. Um, it feels cheap. Feels very cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mean like a good value? Good value. Okay, I like that yeah. phrase better. Yeah. Um, and An affordable luxury. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It, it's yeah. it's not a high barrier. Right. It's it's about depending on the you know the variety. We're about fifty cents to a dollar fifty more than the other sort of natural and organic single serve oatmeal cups. Again, they're using oats. Oats are really cheap, you know, depending on your supplier and the, your scale of your business, definitely less than a dollar a pound. Yeah. So it's almost like filler. It's like when you go to Chipotle and there's a big bed of white rice on the bottom. It's sure. like that doesn't cost them a lot of money. That's right. Yeah. Especially at the volume that they're doing. And so when it comes to you, you're raising capital. So when it comes to speaking to the investors, what are the things that they get hung up on at the moment? So, so in my head, I, I do the analysis of like, okay, this is a better for you product in a category that's established. Check that box. Interesting. Uh, David, you personally seem like you know what you're doing. I like the story. You found some white space. That's really interesting. You can check that box. I think about the ability to get into, into a retailer. It feels pretty straightforward. It's interesting enough for, I think, most retailers to take a risk on or a bet. They're willing to try. And, and they know that maybe it's stagnant in that space. And so then the question becomes, is educating the consumer on something like acorns is their apprehension is it crazy is it fun right and i think it's interesting where i think uh these these impasses per se can either be a massive opportunity or a point of like maybe people won't get it besides that thing sticking out to me in real time as we're talking about this what are some of the things that the investors or the pushback or just the the deeper dives you're doing what are they around I'm not getting a ton of pushback. Okay. Um, yeah, the so, deeper dive. We'll call them the deeper dive. No yeah, pushback. Yeah, so so they they want to know that we have a track record of success in you know across channels. So we we you know we're a new company. We've only been around for we launched at the beginning of 2023. So it's been just over a year, and we've been developing traction. So we have this DTC business, which is growing and actually like sort of progressing towards this, you know, profitability this year. And it's just on your website right now. Folkrival.com. Okay. Oh, we're on Amazon. We're on a few other places. Got it. Um, Subscription based, I'm sure. Yeah. That's an option. We have our first, we have a really nice repeat rate. We're like bringing down our cost per click, per, you know, cost per acquisition. All of our online metrics are trending in the right direction. We're like really actually beginning to scale and it's becoming a self-sufficient business, which, which is really nice, especially yeah. considering how short period of time we've been at this. Yeah, that's great. Um, so people get it. It seems like the consumers understand it or are willing to, to try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and, well, and then and then on the retail side, where I actually I have much more experience than direct-to-consumer, we are on shelf in Whole Foods stores up and down the East Coast. So we're in about 170 Whole Foods stores. We just landed on shelf in January, so it's very early, but we're starting to turn and we're seeing like velocities increase, you know, week after week. We haven't really turned on marketing yet, but that's happening next weekend. We're having our first wave of demos, things like that. So it's very early, but it's behaving and functioning just like we wanted it to. When I think about the marketing side of this, you have an opportunity where you can go full liquid death, right? You can go fully into the squirrel, the nuts. There's a fun, like you can be cheeky to some extent with this opportunity. Uh, what do you think about that? Where's your mindset around the splash you want to make from a branding marketing perspective? So great question. So, and actually I think it, no it, wrong it, answer, it, by it, the way, this is sort of no goes, wrong it answer. It goes back to some of your earlier comment or question around Acorn. So what I have learned from listening to consumers over the past year is that it's the protein and the carbs that yeah. grab people's attention first. Oh. And, and we did not call it, you know, folk revival, you know, Acorn oatmeal or anything like that. We were like very, very clear. Uh, Acorn is mentioned on the packaging, even on the front panel, but it's sort of low down on the hierarchy. We really wanted to like deliver the benefits. People understand the benefits of protein, the benefits of low carb, and that's what grabs people's attention. That's what I think compels people to take a cup off the shelf and turn it over, maybe look at the ingredients, look at the nutrition facts. And then if they do so, they'll read about acorns. Yeah. 
So acorns are a little, so even though it's a hero in ingredient, a it's bit, a yeah. little bit in the background. I think if it just said folk rival acorn hot cereal, I don't think we'd have as many people pulling it off of, off of the shelf. So that, so in terms of marketing, it doesn't feel like we'll go all in on the, you know, cheeky squirrel costume just yet. I think we're going to con continue to talk to protein seekers and carb avoiders, and they have very pragmatic demands. Yeah, I think about myself. So so generally speaking, I'll try to eat like one meal a day. But in that, sometimes I'll play tennis early in the morning, and then I'll get hungry around lunchtime. And so then generally what I eat are like these either beef sticks, something like that, like, you know, high protein beef sticks. I'll also eat like tinned fish. And so tinned fish is obviously just a it's a little bit more expensive. That's between like a 12 to maybe $18 price point. But it's a tremendous amount of protein. Pretty delicious if healthy you're into fats. tinned fish, a lot of healthy fats, some good vitamins also when you sent me your product a while back, like that's the one thing I was doing too. It's like now I had a third option around and it's significantly cheaper actually, mm -hmm. right? And so to your point around the pragmatic buyer, it hits that, it makes sense to me. Right. For people listening uh, who have never had your product, give them a window into how to experience it. So they buy it, they open it, what do they do? It's really easy. You can make it just like any other sort of uh, instant oatmeal. Pour some hot water in it, or in this case, or oat milk or your favorite milk into it. Or you could put, you know, cold water or cold milk of choice into it, put it in the microwave yeah. for, you know, 45 seconds, let it, you know, stir it, let it sit for an another minute and stir again and enjoy. It's like very, very simple. You can also eat it cold. A lot of people like, you know, cold overnight oats. So you could put it, you essentially follow the instructions and put it in the fridge overnight, enjoy it the next morning. Um, it's portable. It's fully sealed, has like a lidding film over it. So it stays, the contents stay in the cup. So it's good to throw in your backpack or purse or whatnot and take to the office, take on your travels, whatever so, it may be. Let's double down on this. And so here we are, we've doubled down on the, on the high protein, low carb. Now I just go fitness enthusiast. Are we, are we partnering with Jillian Michaels? Are we partnering with someone in the, in that space? Just to for sort sure. Of, for sure. Right. For sure. It seems like that becomes sort of an angle, lose the squirrel, lose the acorn to your point. It's an interesting thing we can bring up later, but now you move literally into the, the pragmatic fitness person, perhaps. That's right. That's right. I mean, the, you know, the Spartan races and tough mutters of the world, you know, those, yeah. th those people are buying our, are buying folk revival today. And in that setting, I can imagine if I was like ranking brand folk revival as a name punches much higher than like anything squirrel acorn related. There's something about folk revival that feels on par or on brand with a Spartan race. So let's talk about the name for a second. So, yeah. so folk revival is a funny name. It's a weird name, right? Um, well, there's lots of weird names in the, in the food business. So, so folk, it sort of evokes the human nutrition part, right? The human nutrition part of the mission. The mission is all about sort of delivering real functional nutrition by reviving heirloom and heritage foods. So it has this sort of two part mission. The folk is all about the, the first part, the, you know, the delivering functional nutrition. And then the revival of course is about reviving heirloom and functional foods. So that's sort of the wonky nerdy, uh, so, so naturally I go, what product is next under the same umbrella? <laughs> That's right. So when, when, when we were sort of thinking through the brand, we intentionally sort of stayed away from incorporating acorns in, into the name. We really wanted to eventually have a vision of an umbrella brand that could work across multiple day parts and eating occasions and aisles in the grocery store and hero ingredients. So we're starting with, we're starting with essentially, a. Uh, high protein hot cereal made with acorns, but there's nothing to stop us from going into adjacent breakfast items and, you know, and, and with other hero ingredients. Yeah. So this is what we're starting with. Okay. Um, and actually our next product all, and our, probably our third product also will contain acorns as well, but the, the vision is to introduce and revive other heirloom and heritage foods and continue to deliver real functional nutrition. Just so I'm aware, what products are you considering? Ooh. Like what's on, obviously there's a ton of directions you could, but are you going to stick, let me make it simple. Are you going to stick in the breakfast category? Yeah. yeah. We're, okay. We're, so, and there's efficiencies there. So we're, we're sticking, totally. we're, we're sticking in breakfast. It will also be ambient, but it's not a, it's not a hot cereal. It's not an oatmeal. You don't eat it with a spoon, yeah. um, but it is a breakfast and there's the efficiencies are it's, you know, the supply chain, there's efficiencies. It's also ambient. It, it will ride on the same trucks that, you know, our distributors use to deliver a product. It's, uh, it's the same buyers, the same buyers who, you know, category managers who we are 
really getting to know and who are getting to know us that have gotten behind the brand, they're asking, well, what else do you have? So we're showing them new innovation. And so we're not dealing with now a frozen food buyer or a snack buyer or a beverage buyer. It's still the breakfast buyer. What else can you tell us? You're raising capital. Where are you at on the raise? Where's the company at financially? So we are raising money on WeFunder. So it's wefunder.com forward slash folk revival. Yeah. Uh, that campaign is it's successful, right? It's, it's been successful. Well. We've raised over 100K. Um, it's mostly been colleagues, people I know in the industry. It's been terrific. You know, when I started, I sort of thought this would be like a friends and family round. It really is. Uh, it really is. But I mean, it's for all intents and purposes, really a <laughs> colleagues around. And it has a really low minimum to get in. So a lot of people who are early supporters have been able to get in. It's a convertible note. It's um, sort of all traditional terms, nothing you know, out of the What's order. What's the lowest someone could put in just if they're it's listening? It's just a $100 floor. Okay. So it's very low. You yeah. don't have to be a, a banker or super sure. wealthy if this is something you're interested in and, and supporting. Um, virtually anyone can get in on this. And it's gone great. And we, I mean, I mentioned Whole Foods earlier. We, we actually landed a few other retail chains. So okay. essentially our plan for 24 is to sort of... Well, on the East Coast still? And that, or are you moving no, markets? No, so it, 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 it's varied. So uh, we landed Central Market, which is an important chain down in Texas yeah. that is owned by HEB. And they're a wonderful, very progressive retailer of beautiful stores. This is the first time I'm announcing it, but we just landed a chain out of uh, Chicago called Fresh Time. So it's about 75 stores across Chicagoland and the upper Midwest. Again, beautiful stores, really important chain. And we also landed NCG. So NCG stands for National Cooperative Grocers Association, uh, which is essentially the network of independent food co-ops across the country. Those are the four retailers we're sort of starting with. Whole Foods, we've been on shelf since January. Uh, Central Market, on shelf since January. Fresh Time will hit shelves in April. Uh, NCG will hit shelves at the end of the summer, going into the fall. Okay. Here we are. It's Expo West season. It's Expo West. So you're going to be there, obviously. And so when it comes to raising capital, how much are you trying to raise at the current time? So we'd like to raise about another 150, 200,000. So it's... Uh, we've not much. It's not. It, it's sort of small. Ball. It's enough for us to continue to validate and prove this out across both DTC and in brick and mortar. Um, all the early signs are positive, and encouraging, um, in terms of velocity and the feedback from the buyers and things like that. So we're off to a good start. There's no surprises. We have a very strong broker. So earlier I mentioned that our Acorn vendor became an investor in the brand. Yeah. It's worth noting that our national sales broker became an investor in the brand. Also, our co-packer, the company that helps us sure. put the product in the cups, they became an investor in the brand. So we've sort of built out this little ecosystem of strategic investors. It's a good vote of confidence that these people have gotten to know what we're up to and um, understand our business best that they've actually decided to yeah. invest. Let me go super high level here. And so when it comes to you being the largest buyer of Acorns, this gives you a bit of a monopoly of sorts where you can kind of dictate the market. And so... That's an interesting opportunity just from an investment perspective. At the same time, maybe competition comes on and the relationships sort of may be different or change. How do you look at that? Just just the Acorn market. Do you look at that as like a massive strength for the brand and the company now that you're, these people are also your investors to some extent, right? And so there's, uh, you've created a moat potentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it would be very... Um I don't expect necessarily other direct competitors, say single serve, single serve, you know, oatmeal brands to begin sprinkling acorns into their oatmeal. Like that, that's very unlikely. Okay. If acorns were to appear in other food products across the, you know, across the landscape, beverages or whatnot, I'd welcome it. I actually think that, you know, like a rising tide can often help, you know, raise all ships. Sure. I've seen that in other categories. I've I've worked in, you know, whether it was, you know, dark chocolate 20 years ago, right, where you saw, you started seeing all this news around dark chocolate being good for your health and right. the news started getting out. And I think all of the chocolate brands benefited. I worked at Dr. Prager's overseeing marketing and innovation, and it was concurrent to the rise of Beyond and Impossible. And all of the press that they were helping to generate to drive people into the category, it really helped Dr. Prager's. So there is some sort of benefit if someone wanted to get in and, and, and help tell all of the myriad benefits of acorns, I think folk rival would really benefit from that. I'll sort of deduce this from my conversation. But originally when we met, there was a my brain was like the acorn thing, that's interesting. You would like that to go to the background, that's clear to me. Uh, in the sense of like quinoa came out and everyone just knows quinoa, that's it. 
they don't even know a brand. You couldn't tell me a single brand that actually sells it. I could, but I won't. <laughs> Most people couldn't, <laughs> yeah. right? Because they're just like, give me the quinoa. Yeah. Or if you go to Whole Foods, you can just get it out of the dispenser as an example. Sure. When it comes to that, it's like people are very clearly seeking, you know, the attention grabber is the item, the, the thing, the quinoa. In this example, it really doesn't matter. You're just using a better for you version of something that might already exist and you're packaging it in a different way. And perhaps the only thing that really matters is, is the sense of like you, you in some sense can own the supply chain, but it's not like you're coming to market with that, which is interesting. So one of the things I saw was that, I don't know if this address, I don't know if that was a question or a comment. No, no, it was more of like an understanding for me of like, I think when it comes to products in general, there's like a buzz that you can choose your natural buzz. You can choose, you don't have to choose it, but the natural buzz you can choose could be around the acorn. And we're picking up some of that. There are definitely people coming. I'm not to saying you have to. I kind of like that you're not, in fact. Well, so we're picking up some of it, but I would say that, you know, it's a little bit um, bipolar. So like one pole would be, right. you know, the, the protein seekers and another pole would be sort of the really green lojas or, you know, sort of halo sustainability yeah. consumers who are interested in, you know, wild foraged foods. So, yeah. but we decided to what I found, it wasn't so much that we decided, it's more like we just listened. We listened to see where the interest was. We, we have had our first, we've only, the website's only been live for just over a year. We've had our first yeah. consumers that have purchased more than 10 times. So they're buying Folk Revival essentially once a month. They're buying nearly $100 at a, at a time. They're eating it for breakfast nearly every day. And I have interviewed one-on-one -on -one a bunch of those sort of heavy users to learn about what motivates them. What do they like about the product? What don't they like? What would they change? What, you know, what did it replace in their diet? And what I've learned is the vast majority of them were attracted to it because of the protein and the carbs. So it was almost like we're just, we're taking the path of least resistance in a sense. Yeah. If we heard nine out of 10 people say, oh, is we thought acorns were really cool, then we'd probably be dialing up our acorn communication and making it more sort of, you know, make it pop on the front. Uh, this is the on, on one thing I package. learned in business school. I think the one thing was this, it's like, come out with your assumptions, right? Acorns, protein, and then assume, you know, nothing now and let the world tell you. And so what you're saying is the world told you what they care about is protein and low carb. Boom. That's right. And then you're just going to double down. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so a few things, when we launched the website and started putting it on some shelves across New York city, I got out in front of it as quickly as I could. I did in-store demos face to face with consumers, you know, get to meet 50 people at a time get their feedback. And I did that as essentially as much as I could in early 23 and very quickly decided to make some changes. Mm -hmm. So we made some changes to the recipe, we made some changes to the packaging. We got our non-GMO project verification and we sort of, it took, it takes a few months to do all of this, but we, you know, to burn through the packaging and that type of thing, but we sort of packaged up all of those changes and that's what we pitched to Whole Foods. And that's what Whole Foods said yes to. I think if we had gone to Whole Foods earlier, uh, with the first iteration, I'm not sure it would have been a yes, but we got a yes in the fall. And like I said, a, appeared on shelf in January. And then back to your early point about like protein versus acorns. I mean, one of the, I don't know the best way to articulate this, but it's sort of like, here, I'm more of a natural foods consumer than I am a high protein yeah. consumer. So what I found was as I've gotten older and as metabolism has changed, and as I have to be more more mindful of, you know, my, uh, of my gut, mm -hmm. I realized that there weren't a lot of high protein, low carb options amongst my favorite, biggest, most established natural food brands. There was a little bit of a white space. It's almost yeah. like most of the established natural organic food companies don't have high protein and low carb offerings. This is your story. I and think. then the, the keto brands yeah, don't think, appeal to me. I think this is your story. They're like very, for this, this is large, your space. Yeah. That's it. So it's sort of like blending this world of how can we, I love that. How can we bring in this case, high protein, low carb offerings to the natural foods consumer? I think we just made your tagline, at least in my head. I'm sure you've already thought about that a million times, but for me listening, I'm like, that's it. That's the thing that sort of threads the needle. I see that clearly actually. And it sort of also further reinforces everything you do. It further reinforces who your partners are, who you go to market with. Yeah, uh, and also what you launch the in the identity. future. Totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so you come back on the podcast a year from now. Where's the Where's the business this time, 2025? It's Expo West again. What does it look like? So it's everything you see here with a wider portfolio of products, more availability in more stores across the country, and more robust marketing supporting it, and 
clearer messaging, all of it. It's the, we're just, we're continuing to sort of grow up and graduate to the next level on all of those fronts. Well, David, tell everyone where they can find you. I'll, I'll give you an endorsement. I've tried the product. Big fan. It tastes great. It is very similar to oatmeal, which may be a good thing in the sense of like the, the consumer, the me, doesn't feel like they're taking this drastic leap into sure. the unknown. And so there's some familiarity with the texture and the product itself. It tastes great. And obviously, it's almost hard to believe that there's so much protein and no carbs in it, to be honest. So thank you. But and where can people find you? Where can they support? So they can go to folkrival.com. There's a link at the top of the page to uh, invest. Or you can go to wefunder.com forward slash folk revival, learn more about it, see a little video that we produced introducing you to the brand. You see some financials there and sort of hear our whole story. And selfishly, is there a bag you can buy, like a five pound bag? Coming soon. Okay. And that way you can just scoop it into a bowl. Yeah, sure. David, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.